Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Vermont State Senate Committee on Institutions and the Vermont House Committee on Corrections and Institutions. We are holding a joint meeting this afternoon for the purpose of discussing what is known as the Hawk Report, H-O-K. Um, I am going to skip introductions since we have so many people on screen, but I will uh, first say that today is April 13th, 2021. I'm Joe Benning. I am the chair of the Senate Institutions Committee. We are expecting Representative Alice Emmons, the chair of the House Committee on Corrections and Institutions shortly. Um, we are on YouTube, and as I try to, with every discussion we have in committee, let folks who are on the screen know, especially witnesses, that we have an unknown audience out there on YouTube, and there is a, a fair possibility that there are people out there who have never been involved in a committee process, much less had a conversation as deep into the proverbial weeds as this one might go. So as people are introducing themselves as witnesses, I would ask that you back up the train a little bit, give us a 50,000 foot overview of who you are personally and how you fit into the conversation that we are about to have this afternoon. I am anticipating that um, Representative Emmons will be joining us and will probably take the lead on this conversation. But between now and then, should I hear people using um, strange vernacular or little um, designated names that we are commonly familiar with. I may ask you to back up and explain what that is just so that we have the benefit of giving the audience who may be listening a chance to be up to speed with where we all are. Having said that, uh, Alice gave me uh, marching orders specifically to make a choice between representative, I'm sorry, Commissioner Fitch or Commissioner Baker. And in trying to wrap my head around that discussion and not getting into trouble with anybody, if I understand the hierarchy correctly, I'm going to give that baton to Commissioner Fitch to lead off the conversation, but she's shaking her head no. And in the track world, I know that means the baton is going to get passed to somebody else, which brings me back to Commissioner Baker. Um, Jim, welcome back, and um, I'm going to ask you to first, as I said, give a, a brief overview of who you are and how you fit into the picture, and then we can start, we start to talk about whatever uh, part of the Hawk conversation you would like to talk about, and then we'll pause for some questions when you're done. So welcome to the joint committee session. Thank you, Senator. Uh, for the record, I'm Jim Baker, the interim commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. And uh, my role in this is that uh, the HOK study was done to take a look at our physical facilities around the state and uh, make recommendations and study um, what the future could look like for facilities um, housing individuals around the state. Um, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say a few words, Senator, and then move right. I know Jeff is here now from HOK. And I, they, I know they have a PowerPoint, and I think there's going to be a lot of information there. I'm, go, I'm going to suggest to you um, that we move to that presentation in a minute and let him go through that because there is a uh, substantial amount of information there. I do want to say that um, the work done by uh, HOK under Jeff's leadership and uh, the work done uh, under Commissioner Fitch's leadership on this uh, project uh, was a collaborative effort between us at the Department of Corrections, Buildings and General Services, and um, the contractor that was selected to do this work, HOK. And um, you will see when the presentation is made, a, a, a very substantial amount of time went into this. A lot of thought has gone into it. There's been a lot of give and take. Um, there'll, there'll be a lot of uh, room for conversation afterwards. And um, you know, with that, I wanna turn it over to, to Jeff um, and let him get started so we can uh, get the information out to the members of both committees. The one thing I do have to remind everybody, um, the position um, of, of myself, Commissioner Fitch, uh, the governor, is that uh, we're talking about right now $1.5 million in the capital budget um, for fiscal year 22 and 23 for the next steps in deciding 
based on the presentation today, where we're going to go um, with modern, uh, bringing our systems up to modern standards um, around the state with the understanding that for the Department of Corrections, and I'm not speaking for, for Commissioner Fitch, but I, I know we're on the same page here, from BGS and from the governor's standpoint, um, we're really focused on doing something with the women's facility in South Burlington. That is the priority. That fits into a bigger conversation, which I think you will see uh, when Jeff makes this second presentation um, to all of you about the work that they've done in the study. So if that's good enough, Senator, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yield the floor um, to Jeff Goodell and let him start making the presentation from HOK. Commissioner Baker, appreciate that lead in conversation. Um, Jeff, just to bring you into the picture for the audience that may be listening, this is actually the second presentation that's being given. We had introductory remarks, both committees had them uh, a couple weeks ago for some of us. The uh, report that you're about to hear is the second portion of that, which is more detailed on what the options may be in trying to move forward with corrections. I see uh, by my screen that my committee assistants have violated my specific instructions and let Chair Emmons into the room. Uh, with that, uh, Alice, I'm going to hand the baton over to you. Jeff has already uh, been introduced, but if you'd like to make some opening remarks, by all means. Mr. Chair, I think we ought to take a vote on that, whether we should commit or not. I, I would be tempted to, Senator Mazza, except that our committee is outnumbered here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, Senator Mazza, you and I color coordinated our colors today. Uh, so that you always followed my lead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I've finally had time to zoom in. I was tied up with House Judiciary Committee, but welcome. And, and we on the House side did look at the 1.5 million. Um, we have been quite a, working for the past couple of years, really uh, aware of the situation of our women's correctional facility and really needing to take steps to replace that facility. But we know we can't do it all in isolation without looking at the other facilities. And one piece that's really important in replacing the women's facility, there's also um, policy issues that need to be made in terms, do you just do an incarcerative setting for women or do you also incorporate a reentry program and a separate facility for reentry for women? And if you do that, then you also have to look at, at the male population and offer the same services of reentry services to the male population. So I'm looking forward to the Hawk report because I know that they have quite a few options there for us on how to move forward. And I really hope that going through those options will really help us as the administration and also the legislative body to maybe coalesce around one or two of those options. That's my hope, that's my goal. And with that, um, I can turn it over to um, Jeff Goodell, if we're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for uh, having me back. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, 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 the part one that I did with each of your, uh, of, of the Senate and the House. Um, and I, I, I'm sure everybody though has been waiting uh, <laughs> very patiently now for the next part of, of what, what, what might the path look forward, uh, you know, look like. Um, uh, the first thing I do want to say, though, is, uh, you know, working with working with BGS, uh, Commissioner Fitch's group, and then, and then Commissioner uh, Baker's group at the DOC, uh, they've been great partners. They've been very open. They've been very collaborative. Um, they've taken our charge very seriously that we are, you know, that we're taking a, you know, an objective look at your system really from the outside. But they've also been very helpful and, and cooperative at the same time of giving us a, a lot of needed information. And sometimes, especially with these existing facilities, you know, some real key information about how they really do things there, things that are that, that might not be, a bit, you know, really obvious on the surface. Um, they've been very helpful. So I think that's actually imbued our report with a lot of great detail, especially on the existing condition part, but even looking out ahead um, in, in order to look at, you know, how does the, how does the system work now and how do they want to work in the future? So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to bring up a, uh, Bring up the presentation. 
Jeff, as we yeah. go along, would it be helpful for questions at certain points? Um, I, I'm you... fine with that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, uh, if if you have questions as I go, as I go, that that's fine. Now, the one thing I will say, we're going to get into, uh, you know, let's give you a little preview. We're going to get into five different scenarios. I mean, you can see those in the in the report. The you know the the first one, option A, looks at replacing the entire system in its entirety, um, which was what we were charged with doing, um, you know, by, by BGS. The last scenario looks at if you were to expand each of the fa uh, of, of the facilities, uh, with one exception. We we came to the conclusion that a new women's facility, in any of the scenarios, was really a necessity. But then the other three scenarios in between are kind of in between, so a, a mix of new and existing. So if you have questions on those, that's fine. It might be helpful as I go through to get through the five. And then I could stop at that point and answer questions, but I'm happy to answer questions at any time. If anybody wants to put their hand up and answer questions, I have no <laughs> issue with that. Um, but I might, I might urge when I get to that part about the options, if I could maybe get through those and then we get some questions, because I think some questions might become more obvious as you see the next scenario. That would be the only, that, that would be the only kind of caveat I might have representative. So when we do get to the question piece, because we're sharing a screen, it's hard to see the participant list. So if you can just physically raise your hand in your window and maybe between Senator Benning and myself, we can see who has questions, okay? Yes. Okay. And then feel free to verbally interrupt me at any time if, if somebody does have a, have a question like that. Okay. So, okay, well, great. Um, you know, I'll just as a reminder, HOK is the lead on this, but we have some great partners, uh, especially local partners, uh, Freeman French Freeman, our associate architect um, in uh, in Burlington, McFarland Johnson, who's done uh, certainly a lot of work in the state. And then some of the key uh, folks like Bill Garnos on bed needs proje projections, Marcus Hardy, who is uh, transitioning under the Illinois Department of Corrections. He's a longtime client of ours, uh, great knowledge on operations. And then White and companies done the cost estimating. And I, and I will say, I'm going to give them a special tip because we, they've been through all of these different scenarios and given us uh, great data on all, all of the scenarios. Uh, and I would also come back to Marcus, and he's done a great job of kind of dissecting, you know, staffing and other needs as we look at these different scenarios. So, you know, what I would say is the scenarios need that, that next level of detail. But I think for where we're at, as kind of a, say, a 50,000 foot level you know, looking, I, I, I feel I have a great deal of confidence uh, and pride of what I'm going to show is that we've done, you know, a lot of, a lot of analysis and, and put a lot of care into really understanding the data as, as we're about to present it to you. Um, just as a reminder, the six current facilities, uh, starting on the upper left at Northwest State, uh, Chittenden, which is right now currently your women's facility, uh, Marble, Marble Valley, uh, Southern State, which is your newest facility, and then going up to the right, Northeast Regional and, and Northern State. Um, you know, a reminder here just of the of the different capacities. The women's facility at Chittenden right now, capacity of 177. Marble Valley uh, being your smallest facility at 118 in Rutland. Um, Northeast at 219. Northern State at 433. Northwest at 255. And Southern currently at 377. Now, the 377 is permitted. It could go immediately to 500. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's already actually in place. And then the out-of-state uh, capacity is 350 um, down in Mississippi. And that number, as I recall, is, is, is around 230, 240 that are actually there. So the current capacity is 1,929 uh, beds for the system, including the out-of-state. As we did the projections, and Bill, really led, Bill Garnos really led this part, you know, he did a he did a projection that came out between 2,055 and 2,184 total beds. We settled as a group collectively and said 2,050 was going to be our target number that we're looking at for for that includes all inmates being back in the state and growth and delivery of services. 2,050 is the number, and that's 1,900 correctional beds and 150 reentry beds. 50 of those being female, 100 of those beds being male reentry. Uh, just brief, re re uh, just a review of the existing condition reports. 
Um, you know, all of the facilities, you know, the, the, the most recent one was built in 2004, the oldest one back in, I believe, 1969. Um, some common issues with just wear and tear on those facilities over that amount of time, you know, site issues with water ponding, various kind of uh, sidewalks, parking areas, heaving with concrete, that type of thing. Shell issues as far as window repair, roofing, facade uh, maintenance. And on the inside, um, a lack of a lack of conditioned air, and also um, an ongoing project with repairing detention doors that's been going on but needs to continue to go on, and then other various things as far as carpet shower ceiling replacement throughout all the facilities. That's just a you know, common overview. I think importantly, and I don't know I touched on it enough, um, that that the facilities are all lacking in meeting current codes and standards. Um, in, including, you know, a significantly American with Disabilities Act uh, standards, especially for correctional facilities. So accommodation of, of, of inmates in, in that manner, uh, meeting American Correctional Association standards, and then very important PREA, Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, all of the facilities are, are, um, are in need of upgrade just for those areas to get back to, get back to standards. I'm not gonna spend a great deal of time on any of these things, but very briefly, just space and daylight from American, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ADA. The ADA has the accommodation of people that are ambulatory in wheelchairs, but also people that, are, that have sight issues, hearing issues, and other, and other things that are defined by American with Disabilities Act and, and facilities, new facilities today have to meet those accommodations with a certain percentage. Um, some of the facilities meet that better than others, but they all, um, need some some work in that fashion. Um, one of the things that's really an issue is some of the grading at some of the facilities where inmates have to actually go up up and down long um, uh, grades in order to get from place to place. Uh, American Correctional Association that's day that's daylight and space and air quality. So those are all th those three things are areas that the facilities are in need of of, of some help with. A Prison Rape Elimination Act addresses things like sight and sound, um, being able to have privacy as a, appropriate privacy. The reason I bring all these up again is that even in the expansions, we're taking this into account, not just to add beds, not to just to make them more uh, efficient, but also to solve some of these issues as well. And when you do that though, it does become a more expensive project. It becomes more intrusive into the internal facility. But again, we were charged with looking at the future system for Vermont, not just con continuation with, with the current. You know, project goals, as they were stated, you know, again, uh, housing all Vermont inmates within Vermont, you know, restructure the system to bring Vermont's criminal justice system in line with national standards. And I think that's especially true with the, the ability to offer programs and then the, the staff to inmate ratio. Uh, re restructure the system to pr promote re further reduction of prison population and reduction of recidiv recidivism. Um, you know, we're, we're dedicated like you are to actually shrinking the prison system as appropriate, um, not, not needlessly, but as appropriate. And so newer facilities that are more effective actually can play a role in doing exactly that. And then, um, you know, introduction of the reentry facility to approve offender outcomes. And as we've said, I think collectively, there's an agreement that a new women's facility is really a requirement. Um, we're going to touch, I touched on some images last time. I'm going to touch on them again because they are, again, important for uh, what we're looking forward towards and what new projections were based on. This is a new um, mental health facility in the state of Illinois, 200 beds that is focused on mental health treatment, um, state-of-the-art state treatment where, in the case of mental health treatment, where uh, uh, correctional staff plus uh, medical professionals are together with patients, treating them really together. In a, in, a, in a holistic fashion. Um, this new mental health facility for the state of Ohio, and again, I think you can see the, the, the scale of the building. It's not a, a, a tall double tier, but it's again more, uh, I would say more human scale in, in the way it's put together. And again, with program space, very important. Um, it's, it's important for women, it's important for all inmates, but it's been shown to be very effective, um, again, in reducing recidivism and helping people with the reentry process. You know, we base a lot of this on our, uh, you know, we, we looked at the state of Utah. We, we, they, are, they chose to make, to do a one facility replacement. And that includes in this particular case, 17 different classifications within one large fence, including women's. Um, 
I'm not necessarily suggesting that's the solution here, but we are again drawing from experience, recent experience. This facility is under construction right now, and being able to draw from lessons learned on that as we as we applied it towards the study that we, we that we are doing for you. And this is a computer uh, version of that housing uh, for Utah, uh, which is again more open, more beds per staff. But the more beds per staff is really in a safer setting, where staff really has great. 360 degree view around the entire facility. You can see all of the inmates in there at a given time. Um, talk a little bit just again more about the, you know, about the sleeping spaces, the ability to control light, the ability to have more individualized space, and the ability to have, again, more personalized space and normalized space. Because, you know, if, if, if I can direct you to the middle one at the bottom, you know, we've made the effort in the design to make that more normalized, but I can assure you all those pieces and parts are maximum security. They're, they're anti-ligature, so inmates can't harm themselves, but it, it's also safe for staff, safe for inmates, but, but with the effort towards more normalization um, and more daylight through, you know, larger windows. Um, really thinking a lot about, for, uh, you know, for DOC and the BGS folks in, in maintaining these facilities over time. And you can see more of a typical kind of mechanical chase, an area where staff can go that's not in the secure perimeter or that's not in the secure part of the, of the building, but they can work, they can bring tools and they have an ample area to work on the facilities. And a lot of the current facilities don't have that right now. And there are, you know, there are, there are additional work for BGS to, to maintain them. Uh, I've talked about the emphasis on women's facilities, and I think the important thing, again, the scale, the normalization, uh, the ability to bring in daylight, all important factors, and in, in in however you move forward. But, but again, that's something that we're factoring in as we think about what those facilities would include and, and need moving forward. Program space, um, educational space, counseling space, uh, space to deal with addiction, and also space, very importantly, for, edu uh, for education and vocational purposes. Those have been shown to be very successful. So that that's also in the equation as we look, as we look forward. Um, extremely important medical space, um, not only on the healthcare side, just to treat inmates, but again, the growing need for mental health or the growing recognition of mental health needs and how those things really go together. A lot of the inmates are actually co-diagnosed with both mental health and medical issues very often. And so, spa and so spaces for staff uh, both clinical staff and correctional staff to be able to effectively manage and treat the inmates is, uh, is, is ex extremely important. And we talked about reentry, and you know, reentry is different than the correctional space. And you can see in the bottom right, you know, that's really a residential setting for reentry. And um, this idea that that, you know, that people are, are now learning skills they're be, as they're about to go back out of the system and to really gain the skills and gain that confidence being able to go back and to help make them more effective members of their family, their community again, and, and not to just come out of what is a traditional prison space right back out into society, but to, again, to really transition that and, and, and to have space that's appropriate for that all to happen. And the last item here is, is just, again, as I mentioned last time, trauma-informed design that in fact, you know, the, the, you know the, the people that are in the system, and this is not just inmates, but this can also apply to staff as well. Uh, I mentioned before the studies that show the PTSD issues that can come along with you know, staffing in these facilities is that space that uh, allows people to have some power over their own personal space, to be able to control light, to be able to feel safe, very important, and it, it, and it really has great outcomes for your system as, as data shows, there's less assaults, less, uh, less, less vandalism, all the other things that have been issues in all correctional facilities over time are reduced through these, you know, these design approaches. And these are some of the benefits from improving or, or having newer facilities. Um, we'll talk just a little bit about, well, again, on our basis of design. So we applied some of those same factors and what would, I, what would the typical housing unit be? And we spent a little bit of time with the DOC and the BGS folks to think about what, you know, what, what housing might look like in the future, not, not to design it, but again, to have a building block to look at as, as we do the projections. And we talked about some of the appropriate uh, staff to bed needs you know, for different classifications. So this would be uh, perhaps a, a female close custody, which could be maximum security, it might be mental health. It's probably a one to 16 ratio. So that, that might be more like some of your typical facilities, but for the special needs that one to 16 is appropriate. 
and it includes the day space, the outdoor rec that's associated, and all of those all of those elements. We've talked about before being able to bring daylight in and being able to um, work with the windows and so forth for appropriate levels of private, you know, of, of privacy without throughout the facility. So we're not in the detail here, but we are suggesting that again, the projections would be based on facilities like this. And again, facilities like we've done in other areas and other places. Um, as, as we look at, um, at, at medium security, these might be multiple uh, bed units, not just one in a, in, a, in, a, in a room, but they might be up to four. So that, that number might increase to 24 in this particular one, on, and again, on the female. And, and we think it's appropriate that, that in the female staff to inmate ratio is typically smaller than it is on, on male. Male's typically gonna be a higher number. Female minimum security, again, similar, but the rooms increase in size. And again, we're just using the same module in a lot of different ways to have the different classifications. Also gives you flexibility that if for some reason down the road, uh, you were to decide, well, we need more minimum or we need more of something else that, the, that these units can actually have the flexibility to actually change and be run differently. And you're not just hamstrung because you were extremely uh, prescriptive with a particular way to, to design or build the facilities. And uh, we'll go to the next one, pardon me. There we go. Uh, male close security might be larger, again, 24 beds, but that's a larger unit because again, we're separating the males more. This area might now be 7,600 square feet, but again, based on the same module and go to 48 beds for, for medium security. And this might be a two tier. So this might be, as we showed on the Utah, uh, on that Utah computer anime or that computer rendering, plus what you're, you know, what you have right now in the system, you know, now you get to 48 beds and you go to two tiers. So there's room for the two tier, there's room for single tier. Uh, but again, they're based on the same, the same module. And, and, and th th this was the module that we used as a basis of design. And a male minimum, again, more dormitory style. Now, again, we've heard from the DOC, dor pure dormitory hasn't worked out very well, but um, we're looking at something that's a dormitory style that might be eight people in a room. Um, so it's not as many cells. Um, there is, and one of the advantages for eight people in a room or, or multiple in a room is there's actually more socialization in that particular case. So that can actually be an important element uh, for your department. But, but whether that's four people, six people, eight people, that would be a determination down the road. But we, we went with eight for right now to have something that's really, I guess I'd call it a hybrid type of uh, dormitory that doesn't have all the same issues of just pure open dormitory that haven't worked very well for DOC in the past. So the next chart, um, we're, we're about to get to the options. So as I mentioned, option A is really retiring all six of the current facilities and having a new male, a new female, and then one new male and one new female re-entry. Option B maintains Southern State. And, it, uh, and then it has the other new ones that I, that I mentioned as far as the new female, new male, now the new male would be a little bit smaller. So we'll, and we'll talk about some of the detail of that. Um, as, we, as we look at option C, that maintains really the two facilities in the, in the, north, uh, the Northeast, uh, being Northern State Northeast, um, being able to be, remain open and, uh, and, and remain active. It includes an expansion at Southern and then it includes the three new facilities, a new male, again, a smaller one than might be an option A, and I'll get to that detail. Um, the new female, and all, the new female one in each case is a static number. Um, I, I believe it's, it's 200 in each case. And the new uh, male and the new female reentry are, are part of that as well. Option D then um, contemplates an expansion at Northwest while keeping Northern State Northeast open. And again, the expansion at Southern, and then the other three facilities that I've mentioned before. And then option E, um, the only facility that closes under option E is Chittenden. So the, that's the, the women's, that becomes the new female. The rest of the other five all remain open and with Northern State, Northwest and Southern all expanding. Uh, and, and the other two also um, having some renovation to them. Um, and then the new male part, the new male prison is not part of the equation, but a new female and a new, uh, and then a new re-entry re in each case. 
if I look at the far right, the numbers vary just a little bit. Again, we use 20, 2050 as sort of our baseline. Rather than get into some kind of artificial unit numbers, we just kind of took new units, made them come out close. So again, you know, the next step would really to be get in more detail, more fine tuning of these numbers. But you can see, you know, ranging from 2032 in the, it, you know, in the, in the option E, which is most existing, um, to 2070 in option D, 2067 and C, 2063 and B, and then 2046 would be the new one. Those are all within, you know, uh, you know, uh, within 38 beds of each other. So again. How that's done in the future, that, that's I think up to up to further study. But this, in in essence, uh, lays out how the five different scenarios uh, were derived. So we'll talk here about option A. Option A is the replacement of of all six facilities. You can see the circle that we placed is in, and I want to point out, you know. It's a vague area somewhere <laughs> in, in, within shouting distance of Burlington, uh, but, but we don't have a site. We haven't identified a site. We don't know exactly how many acres, so I don't want anybody to come out with that, that wow, you found a place to go. That's not the case at all. However, what we are saying is that if, if you were to place new facilities, it would be important to be able to draw um, from population centers, not only for correctional officers and people working at DOC, but also other medical professionals, counselors, psychs, and other people that, that are important to these facilities and could either work in the prison part or the reentry part. So um, as we look at what, you know, how the bed breakdown would work, in the, in the new male facility, the new male prison, it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly large facility, 1,752 beds. Um, and, and I would say from a national perspective, that is, that's, a, that is, that's kind of a common number for a new prison throughout the country, no matter what DOC you're talking about. That's a, you know, 1752, that's right around the 1,800 bed mark. That is a, that's a fairly common one that's kind of viewed as a new prison that can be run with one warden and a correctional staff that's based around that. In the case of the women's in this particular case, 144 new beds, prison beds, um, 100 reentry and 50 female reentry. And I guess I misspoke a little bit before I said 200 women's. I was really saying around 200 total, but the breakdown is 144 for the for the prison section, 50 for the uh, for the reentry for women, and that totals up to 2,046 um, total beds in a in a new in a brand new system. Now uh, we'll just take a little. We'll take a little look at at, at at what is entailed in that. And I guess you know the important part is again we really try to consider all things that needed to be in a in a prison as we did the projections, as we did the square foot projections, and as we did the cost projections, which will which we'll be getting into a little in a little bit later. But in a typical facility, we have the housing, and then we have the and then we have the support. And support includes administration, security programs, certainly food service, laundry and a central plant of some kind. Um, and, and, then, and then the other infrastructure parts that are required, you know, as, as far as dealing with uh, water, wastewater, electric, parking, um, fencing, all those elements, those have gone, all gone into the cost estimates, they've all gone into the, re into the required acreage that we've talked about in each case. And so this might be one way the female facility might look, could look a lot of different ways, but these are the building blocks that we think would be common no matter you know, no matter how that would work, including also recreational facilities um, as well. Um, this is a, a typical diagram of, of the reentry. And certainly, you know, the reentry is of the kind of size that one building would certainly suffice that might have other recreation uh, aspects outside of it. Uh, but it also, you know, as we include in cost estimating, you know, the building envelope, the elements within that, of course, this is now going to be you know, minimum type of security housing, um, so it's less expensive, and then parking and other other elements that go along with that. As we look at the male facility, and again, this is a, a larger facility, and it can be arranged in a number of different ways, but this is one way that it can be, where the housing is really kind of wrapped around an area that's that's for rec services, and it also enhances the ability for staff to be able to get to the you know the the buildings. I mean, as one example. You know, you know, inmates have access from the inner part of this campus, but 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 maintenance staff might have access around the outer part. So that's a way to separate 
you know, the secure area for inmates versus the not the less secure part for, for staff, which enhances the ability of BGS to actually run these facilities. You know, so that, that, that's one, that encapsulates one strategy that you might use in arranging a campus. But again, as I mentioned before in the women's, these are the numbers and the elements that would go along with this facility with, the, with uh, again, typical square footages, typical kind of parking requirements. Um, and again, in the report, we're in a, a really good amount of detail on these, and I can certainly answer some questions if we do have, you know, detailed questions. But, you know, this again is a representative element. I think it's important as we do this, and, I, and we've seen from other programs sometimes that they'll, they'll take into account, okay, you have this many beds and we'll put this much square footage towards it. And that's certainly a valid way to do it, but our methodology uh, that we use in a typical kind of HOK method is to get beyond just putting square feet per bed, but actually really thinking about all the elements that actually have to go into the facility and identifying something like a central utility plant, because for our cost estimating team, you know, a, a central utility plant costs something different than a housing unit. And it costs something different than the, than, than the, uh, the public lobby. And, um, and, it, and then this gives them an idea of how much fence there might need to be. So that, again, they've taken all of these things into account as they've tried to take you know, this top down look. But what we found is by taking this approach and identifying all these elements, and we've, you know, we know what these elements are from our experience doing similar facilities, we really end up with a more accurate view of what the costs are, especially as you start to move these programs further. And that what we're talking about today is something resembling what you'll end up with in the end. And I think that predictability is important, um, that, that you know all in what you're getting. Uh, the one thing we don't do, we don't know exactly where your land is. We don't know exactly what those land acquisition things are. So we can stay away from that right now. That'll be looked at in the future, I know. But, but as far as what these facilities are, identifying these parts and applying costs to them, we have found has, you know, helps bodies such as yourself have a more predictable and accurate way of actually dealing with these issues as you move forward with them and want to analyze it further. Hey, um, Jeff, can I ask a question? This is please. Joe Benning. Yeah. Um, the previous slide, can we take sure. a look back at that, please? Yes. If I understand this correctly, technical training and programs and services down at the bottom, is that an area where there would be attorney client telephones or video cameras to connect with the courthouse? And if so, does that mean uh, anybody who's up in the minimum security unit is going to have to be uh, brought all the way down from where they are to those two rooms? Or do you have separate areas in each one of those security sections? So today, you know, so it's the second, as you are asking. So today, what we really fo focus on is having video um, teleconferencing options at the, at the, at the housing itself okay. and 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 especially for attorney meetings having rooms that can be uh that can be shut and secure so nobody can hear what's going on nobody can even actually see i mean um correctional staff can monitor the call in terms of um you know uh, it, in terms of appropriate behavior but as far as hearing the actual conversation type of thing no and so every inmate will have the opportunity at their housing unit to have that access okay uh, thank you you bet. Jeff, could I ask a question as well? This is sure. Representative Campbell. Um, they, I realize this is a, these are schematics. The light green areas uh, with all of the living uh, yeah. areas, what, 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 what does that represent? Those are representative of probably the mechanical areas. Uh, I see. And, and that non that non secure element where the where the BGS folks would have most of their access. I see. So okay. the other color representing more of their actual housing and the secure part. Oh, okay, thank you. Sure. This, Jeff, this is Representative Emmons. I'm trying to <clears throat> get a concept here in terms of the schematic. Is this all within one building or is your administrative part in a building and then you have the individual housing units in separate buildings where the offender, where the inmate has to walk outside to get to the cafeteria or get towards their programming. How is so, it structured? Yeah, no, so, and that's a good question. So these are, cam this, these are campuses and this oh. is a campus in this case. So each of these color blocks would represent approximately a building. 
Um, and so these would be the housing buildings. They're arranged around outdoor campus areas. In this case, we're depicting baseball, softball. We have some basketball, we have soccer, just an area, again, whatever those areas would be. But that's the outdoor rec centralized. And then, as you just said, at food service, we'd have the dining halls. And, you know, and, and for minimum or medium security inmates, they'd probably go to dining halls. For, mi for maximum, they may, in special needs, uh, food carts might be brought there. And so typically we will, we will have more of the special needs closer to where the food service and the medical service and everything are. So they're in close proximity because they may have more of those services delivered to the unit. I think also importantly, we've included like special needs here close to the vehicle sally port because they often, they're more often uh, have ambulance visits. So we would have that arranged. So medical, emergency medical services would be able to access these buildings very easily through that as well. So, um, and then, you, you know, further around this perimeter, um, I don't know if you can see my area, but around that perimeter, the, 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 the straight lines represent that, uh, the, the, uh, the security fencing, the two, re two rows of security fence. So all those buildings inside that fence are part of the secure perimeter. And then on the outside of the fence, we would have a, a processing part on the far right for the public lobby. That would then be able to process into some kind of visitation center. And even though you know, we would have, you know, we would suggest or we'd program video visit, we also know that in a prison, live visit is also important. So there was a trend a few years ago where everybody's moving all to video visit, but we found that really it's not just one or the other. It really needs to be all of those things, including family, family reunification, visitation, all that th type of thing. So that would happen at the far right. And that allows, you know, that has public penetrating your facility as little as possible. And then the other buildings that are outside the fence are the ones that you don't, you know, that we don't need to process people in central utility plant, uh, the facility and maintenance storage, warehouse, perhaps vehicle maintenance. Those elements would be outside the fence. Um, as, as, along with other utility things such as water towers. So, um, so the elements within the, the straight line area represent those secure buildings. Um, these are individual buildings with the housing and then that bar along the bottom is really those, those inmate services and staff areas within the fence. So this is really the foundation of all your other options in terms of how a building would be, how the campus would be laid out. So yeah. this question is for all of the other options as well, not just for this. What we find right now within our current facilities, the way that they're designed, the way the beds are designed, the cells are designed, it's really limited in terms of who can be housed there. So when we say the general population of our incarcerated population may not need a specialized bed, they may not need closed custody, or they may not need <clears throat> a special unit, but they need that general population. And that's where we're having problems right now within our current facilities. We don't have that flexibility right. for the general population. So how flexible are these cells in these beds? For that, you know, I would say that uh, we, you know, the way that and again, if I go back to the percentages that we used, uh, we had around ten, I think ten, maybe fifteen percent that we considered maximum security. The medium security were uh, about fifty percent, about half your population. Um, minimum was I, I want to say around another twenty, thirty, and then the special needs was around twenty. The difference between those is not so much in the architecture, it's, it's, it's in the numbers, but the way that we would typically design a male, ma uh, say a maximum security versus a medium security in terms of the fixtures, hardware, hollow metal, glass, that type of thing, actually not very different. So if you needed to use, you know, you had a big growth in me uh, you know, medium security and you were running out of room and you were able to use more maximum security, you'd be able to operate that way without having a hardship. Um, the numbers might be a little bit different, but the way that the building is built would still lend itself to that. And even in the minimum security where, you know, we, we said, well, we're not using a dormitory, but we're using something kind of like a dormitory. It allows you to have the numbers in there in a still pretty secure uh, area. So the level of security between minimum up to, up to maximum 
is is not that different. It's more in the numbers and it's more in in the staff to inmate ratio. But typically, you know, like this these kinds of if I go back just a little bit, you know, if I look at these rectangular kind of approaches, we can we can plug in a, a lot of different types of cell types within that. The day spaces are relatively the same. The outdoor spaces are relatively the same. The program spaces are relatively the same. So, you know, there is flexibility built into that where you wouldn't be able to, you, you wouldn't say, gosh, I've got all these, ma I got all these minimum security inmates. I have no place appropriate to put them. Um, the, the units would, you know, have some flexibility. And I think, again, in further study, you might even fine tune that more of, you know, where do you blur the line between maximum and medium? Where do you blur the line between minimum and medium? And how do you have these strategies where you could house either type of inmate in a, in a given scenario without being detrimental to operations? Because I know one of the issues, and you might be talking about, and, and I've dealt with this with some other clients, is that they actually lack maximum security beds. And they have inmates that should be in maximum security, but they don't have an appropriate place for them. So the wear and tear and issues with vandalism, issues with assault, really are 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 are, are bad in those types of situations. Whereas if they had more maximum security beds or more appropriate security, more anti-ligature types of environments, they could put kind of any inmate in those areas, especially at least for temporary conditions. Because sometimes that is what you have. You know, sometimes you might have a spike. Um, you know, we might have a situation here where, again, there's something like a COVID again. But in the scenario that I have on the screen here, you could easily say, you know, rather than eight people in a room, maybe we'll have four in a room. And the day, day space might be less. So, again, that flexibility can help in a, in a pandemic situation as well. So, while we can't come up with architecture that's perfect for every situation, we really do try to make the effort to have kind of a universal type of footprint that you could then plug different uh, elements into. And I just want to clear, clarify for committee members, because we have some new members to the world of corrections here, that a person's security level, the minimum, medium, or maximum, which we really don't have much maximum in the state of Vermont, most, most of that is closed custody. It's not based on what your charges and convictions are. It's based on your behavior in the incarcerated setting. So you could have the most heinous crime that you've been convicted of, but you may be so well behaved that you would be in a minimum security. So people sometimes conflict those minimum, maximum mediums with what folks are convicted with, and it's not connected to your conviction. You know, that's a very good point. And, and I'd add further, because your system is a combined system where you have sentenced and then you also have pretrial. Um, uh, many of the pretrial, as they're new into the system, are less known what their behavior is going to be. And so being able to put them in a situation um, where at least through a classification system, you get a better knowledge of who they are, how they're going to behave. And to your point, we, we've seen people that have come in on relatively minor charges, but inside they may have a psychic break. There may be issues with addiction that they've had. They, they're, they're a less than ideal type of resident. Where others, as you've said, have been, been in for a crime that is definitely considered more serious, but in this setting, uh, they don't seem to pose as much of a threat to others, and so they can live you know, among other people. And I think it's, you know, the, the Department of Corrections has a, has basically a tool that they use to you know, identify the histories of all these folks, you know, interview them, understand any type of gang affiliations, drug use you know, history, that's a mental health history, and be able to use that really you know, detailed report to help determine where people should live within the, within the facility. So and that's an excellent point you make. And I think, you know, again, at the next level, however you go, you know, to break down those beds even further based on what those particular classification needs and what's trending for your state will really be important. So let's move on because time is going. Sure. In. Well, and after, you know, that's great. And after we've gotten through one, the other ones will actually go relatively quickly because I'm not going to, I'm not going to cover every detail of, of each one. So we'll get back to the where we were left off before again was the reentry for the mail. This was the fourth facility in option A. And, um, and again, I think rightfully we're spending a lot of time on A because that's the all new one. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of advantages to option A. The biggest one be, being that you would have, you know, from an operational standpoint, it would have less staff requirement um, because you'd have essentially, you know, one male warden, one one female facility warden, you know, rather than multiple. Um, plus, you know, the ability, you know, the need to move them around your system would not be as costly. Um, it would solve all of your ADA, pre and ACA standard needs. So it, it would do that. And um, now, now on a couple of the, the drawbacks is that because you're the combined system with all your counties and your sheriffs, one central facility would have to be very carefully chosen to be able to work for everybody. And we know that could be a hardship. And as we get to the total cost, obviously this scenario will cost the most. And we'll and we'll get more to the detail of that, but um, that, but that's that's kind of the outlay of what of what option A is. Option B um, looks at, an, at at new facilities for for men, women, and then a combined new facility in the northeast. So it it combines the two facilities, uh, northern state, northeast, into one new facility, and it and again it it looks at doing the ex, as an expansion at southern. So that would be the difference. So you're looking at a couple of new, at, at more new facilities plus then the expansion at Southern. What, what the difference here is you have more new facilities and it has more geographic diversity to it. Um, and overall, over time, it would have a, you know, a, a positive impact on your staffing needs. Um, it still does close down the facilities that are on the, on the west part of the state as well. So this keeps one facility open, Southern state adds new facilities. Um, and then again, here's the breakdown of that. I won't go into every number again. They're in the report. It has a grand total of 2,063. And again, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the women's facilities we're contemplating here, the women's correctional, women's reentry, that, those numbers stay static. The men's numbers start to change a little bit. In that new Northwest one, we're looking at 600 beds. And in the uh, new Northeast, we're looking at 648 total beds. And then we're expanding the beds at Southern from 377 to 521. So I said I wouldn't go through the numbers, but I did just go through the numbers again. Um, now, this shows what a smaller but still significant size 600-bed uh, male facility might look like. Again, it has all the same components that the one larger facility had, um, but with just fewer beds. And what we were looking at in, our, in, the, in the study was that this facility for men would also entail more of the special needs. Again, more of the medical, mental health, acute, acute need uh, treatment here. Um, again, it's close to Burlington, but it would, again, be able to, to concentrate more of those services for one population here. So the other two facilities would be more medium security, whereas then the special needs and treatment would be at this facility in, in the Northwest. And otherwise, the other components, again, a campus style, the other components are similar as to the larger male that I showed, just again, scaled differently for the, for the smaller population. The female, again, the same as we showed before, so I won't go into that detail. The uh, reentry, again, the same as before. That was the male, here's the female reentry, the same, the same footprint. There we go. Uh, but then we also contemplate over on the, on the, on the Northeast, um, Again, and really, I guess, you know, splitting up the special needs, but also having more male secure, medium security and being a slightly larger facility as it really combines those two populations in the Northeast. But again, very two, two similar facilities, one in the Northwest, one in the Northeast, uh, similar missions, um, the ability to have special needs treatment, but this one also has a fair amount of medium and minimum security to it. And then the expansion at Southern. So this contemplates taking Southern and then the, the, the parts in color would be where those expand, expansions are. One of them being beds, another being a new technical training building, which is again, has, has been permitted for. And so to be able to realize going ahead and expanding that um, at Southern State. Um, some of the same advantages, this, this, this would uh, solve many of the ACA, ADA, and PREA, not necessarily all of them because you are using some existing beds, but it would solve most of those. It does have more geographic diversity to it. Um, probably the drawback though, this is, uh, this is an expensive solution in that you're building more new facilities. And just given capacity of, of, of how to go about building, this will take time. This one, this one 
just in our analysis, probably takes the longest to, to build. Option B is, is probably the lengthiest program. Option A is less because you're just kind of building all new at once. Option B would take longer as you're having to build new facilities than to retire old ones. Option C maintains the facilities in the northeast part of the state while building a new one in the northwest and then does the expansion at southern. Um, so that's, that's the key difference between B and C. Um, the beds remain somewhat the same now on the two blue ones that we're showing the existing. We have 433 beds at northern. We have 219 beds at, uh, at northeast. We have a total population of 2067. So again, it's, it's, it's essentially the same program as B, except it, 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 it builds one less facility and maintains two existing ones that you have. And in our view, Northern state, Northeast regional are decent facilities um, that, they, that, that you can maintain and that the emphasis on expansion would still happen at Southern state. We'll just touch, well, again, this is the 600 bed one in Northwest, same as the other scenario, same female, same male reentry, same female reentry, same expansion at Southern, and then this just doesn't show new expansion, but you do see the note on ADA. Uh, we, it's our belief that no matter what you do, if you maintain existing facilities, even if you don't expand beds, there is ADA work that needs to happen at those. Um, you can see this kind of odd jog at the top of the diagram. That's because it's, there's a big grade there. And so that is prohibitive for inmates and it really in some cases staff to be able to uh, you know, traverse that area. So there, we would recommend still looking at some of these ADA issues. And then um, at the, and the other one in the Northeast part of the state, again, no, no new additions here. Um, C, as far as advantages are concerned, again, um, it's less capital outlay for you. It can take less time to build. It maintains geographic diversity for you but it also does give you significant new beds. Um, it, it gives you significant, again, women's facilities. It, it, it has a, still a significant male facility to replace some older facilities that really need replacement. Uh, probably the one thing that this one starts to move in the opposite direction is that it solves fewer of the ADA pre and ACA standards. So those are the, really the trade-offs that you look at. You can, you, you meet more of the standards with new, you meet less of them with existing, but you do maintain more geographic diversity. And I think this one also build, you know, builds less um, overall. So the overall capital cost, as we'll see, is, is reduced from what B is. And I'll hit D and E fairly quickly because again, they really focus again on, on your existing facilities. This contemplates um, uh, keeping um, even the north, Northwest facility operating, but still closes down uh, Chittenden and Marble Valley. Here's the grand total, 2,070 beds altogether. Um, Northwest State does have some expansion to it, um, as well as Southern, and we still are keeping Northern State and Northeast uh, roughly the same as they already are. Quick, the diagram. Quick, quick, yeah, sure. I have a quick question on the option C pros back about two slides. Yep. Yes. That last statement, the option B is designed, that it that D is correct. So this one does not uh, meet those current standards, correct? This one C does, does so less. Yes, correct. Right. Less, but not, it's right. still B does them all, C does a f most of them. Most of them, right, right. That's okay, correct. good. Thank you. Yep. So, Jeff, can you clarify the difference between C and D? Does C also, does C close Marble Valley? Yes. And does D close Marble Valley? It does. Both, both of them close Marble Valley. And both of them keep open Newport and St. Johnsbury. Yeah, I think the, the biggest difference with D is the idea of keeping Northwest open. But C also has Northwest open where Northwest would include your Chittenden facility and your Marble Valley facility, correct? C closes Northwest and builds a new facility somewhere in the vicinity. Okay. So we're, we're showing Northwest closed, but uh, okay. somewhere in the general vicinity opening a new one in that area. 
where the D keeps Northwest open as it is. So that's the only difference between C and D. Yes, it really is because they, they all they all they all close Chittenden, they all close Marble Valley, but but Northwest being open versus a brand new mail uh, is the big difference between C and D. Okay, and then that can really get into your cost because yes. if you keep Northwest, you're going to have to do renovations. You do have to do renovations, oh. right? Correct. Yep. Yeah, you do have renovations on Northwest versus uh, versus the cost of doing new. Um, and I, I will say this, and, I, and I, I, I told the BGS and DOC folks, if we were doing this live, if we were doing it remote, I'd have probably five boards up in the room with you. <laughs> we could be, it'd be easier to compare these. Uh, because so I realize as I'm going slide by slide, I, I'm glad you're stopping me and asking because it's not, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep track of. I've been living with it for a couple of months now. This is kind of, this is new information uh, for the rest of you. So does that answer that though, between the difference in C and D? It does. So the question is the basic difference between C and D. One, you get rid of the current St. Albans facility and you build new for that, incorporating Chitton into Marble Valley. D, you're using that facility with maybe some renovations, but you're bringing in Chittenden and you're bringing in Marble Valley. Correct. Okay. And all of the scenarios increase the Springfield facility by about 150 bits. Right, right. Okay. So as we go through D again, you've seen this one. Um, this is a smaller, or I, I'm not sure this diagram is exactly right as I'm looking at it, but 348 beds for a, uh, for a male. This is the female facility. Reentry again. The expansion at Southern, again, the same. Uh, no expansion here at, at Northern, Northeast and a little bit of expansion at Northwest, as you said. So this, this doesn't really increase beds, but it does do bring some, if, if, if you were to keep Northwest open, there are some much needed um, renovations and modernizations that need to happen at that facility. So the cost estimate does take that into account. And then, uh, and so D, you know, operates more of your facilities. It really kind of eliminates though, um, as much for new mail as, as you might as you might have had in another scenario, it does keep your geographic diversity. Um, but and as far as being able to meet standards, it does that the least. Um, this this addresses standards, you know, the least. Obviously, option E will be even less so. So again, you're starting to, you know, you're you're keeping other facilities going, um, and kind of living living with that and living with the lack of standards. But again. These are all scenarios that are offered, you know, depending on how you want to deal with, you know, the required revenue for them. And I think that's the important thing. E really just contemplates again new female facilities, um, and and then does more expansion at your existing. So it does more expansion at Southern, more expansion at Northwest, more expansion at, at Northern State. Um, and so you can see. We're actually looking at Southern going up to 617 beds, which we believe it has the capacity for. It doesn't currently have the permitting for, but it has the capacity for. And this expands Northern State to 529 beds. And it expanded, uh, again, just the, the expansions I showed you before with Northwest. Now, what that will do at Southern and Northern is it does require not just the beds, but some additional other infrastructure things because you have more, you have more inmates, you have more staff, you, need, you, know, you may need to expand the kitchen some other things like that. But again, these are possible. And as we said, you know, Southern State, your newest one has the most, ex has the most capability of expansion over time. And I guess I should also just say, we've laid these out in five options. As you go down the road, there may be pieces and parts from a, you know, from a variety of these. You might say, well, E was the only one that expanded Southern State to 617, but that's what we'd like to do. So we can do that in combination with another. So there's different ways to break them down. We tried to keep them in these five groups because we thought this was the most comprehensive way to do it um, or comprehensible way to do it. But again, you know, everything was the goal was to get to that number of beds, build a new female, get all your inmates back in the state and solve as many of the ACA and ADA issues as possible 
given whatever they you know whatever that budget might look like. Um, I think you've seen you know you've seen these different layouts. Now this. Now it's Southern, this shows a little bit more housing. So that's again, that, that, that further expansion at Southern. Then some expansion at Northern. Uh, no expansion really at North, Northeast and the expansion we showed before at Northwest. And, um, and this does also look at if you did keep Marble Valley open as well. Again, it's your smallest, but you know, one thought about Marble Valley um, as you know, it could, be repurposed in the in the venue of a of a male reentry possibly, you know, given its size, you know. So again, there would be renovations there. We haven't really studied what that might require, but uh, but you know, there might be a way to utilize that facility and repurpose it in some way. So we kind of just kept it in the mix here, as far as as, as these options go. Um, this one has lower overall construction costs, as you might imagine, because we're not building as much new. This solves the fewest amount of, uh, of, of standards. Um, it does keep your geographic diversity as far as partnerships with the sheriff's departments, but it, you know, it, 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 but it also doesn't create as many effective new modern beds as, as any of them. Again, this is the one that's, that's the least total construction cost, but it also solves you know, the fewest amount of of overall issues within the within the system. So this is just a recap again, we saw this chart right at the beginning. This just lays out which facilities are new, which ones are expanded and which ones are still in operation. And then the circles with the dashes around them are the ones that would be closed in every given scenario. Again, they're in the report. Uh, this is just our scorecard to try to you know, keep all these different scenarios uh, straight. So this is an important chart as we kind of compare advantages and disadvantages of all these different approaches. And you can see at the top, option A solves the most issues. It's a brand new, it's a brand new facility. The two things it doesn't do as much of, it has the issue with the geographic diversity and it also has an issue and, and we should just be frank that, you know, some of these facilities clearly have become part of the community they're in and just saying, hey, we're just gonna move this one it's not that simple. They're part of that community. And so that's, that has to be taken into consideration as you think about any of these, is what's the offset and cost, but also what's, what's the cultural and economic impact it might have on a, on a given community. Um, now, having said that, you know, your, your per diem costs, as we showed before, were as high as around 192. But now if you average the per diem cost for inmate in any of these scenarios, you can see even the most expensive win, which is option D, um, is at $124 per inmate. That's, that's substantially less than your most expensive. Now in the all new scenario, that number goes as low as, as $99 per diem per, per inmate. Again, I should emphasize that's in today's dollars. We have not, we have not really built in uh, escalation over, you know, over 10, 20 year scenario here. Uh, you know, that again, that's I think for BGS's, uh, you know, financial auditors to take a look at. But the capital cost per square foot also is less than an all new facility. And that number goes up just because again, building in the existing facilities just goes up and the less square footage you built that you build that dollar amount goes up. Now, if you look at the next to last one, that's an important one. Option A is a $330 million all in option. If you do everything all at once, and I should emphasize, these are the numbers if you do everything at one time. Option B actually goes up because you're building yet another facility even though they're smaller we have that as 379 million. You can see option C, which eliminates the all new facility in the Northwest comes down to 252 million. Pardon me, one second. Um, option D, 247 million, actually similar to option C. And uh, option E is $234 million um, that, that does, you know, that does the least amount of expansion. So relatively speaking, C, D, and E are, are similar. Uh, A takes another step up and B takes the highest step up in terms of, uh, of dollars. So in terms of recommendations, working with the DOC, working with BGS, we've been back and forth over these many times. 
the preferred scenario out of all of these right now appears to be option C. You know, based on the costs that we saw before, I think importantly, you know, it, it, it contemplates new facilities that would be the replacement of the facilities in the West could be done over a time frame. And I think it's important to look at a master plan as something that doesn't, that isn't necessarily a, a you know, do it all at one time, but really, again, gives you a plan, a game plan and roadmap how to move ahead over time. Um, we talked about these pros of option C before. It does solve quite a bit of the ADA, PREA, ACA standards, not all of them, but quite a few of them. It does, it does take into account that you do have some existing facilities that are assets. We don't consider them total liabilities. So it does have that ability. It does maintain some geographic diversity for your partners with the, with the sheriff's departments and, and courts too, I should, I should mention. Um, and, it, you know, and again, it is a scalable option. Uh, you know, one of the things that we did was not to say if we did, and we only took a option C here because it was kind of the, the most preferred out of all these and said, if you, if you were to, you know, if you were to embark on this, you know, how might you do it in steps? And the first thing obviously is the thing that has to happen this next year is really this more, this deeper dive on programming. And then you get past year two and then you start to really, I think, again, look at a women's facility first. Um, and, you know, but you can see here in this, in this scenario, as you build these in stages by year 12, you have all your inmates back in the state. So again, this is a long-term proposition, not a, not something that we would envision you'd necessarily fix, you know, in year two or three here. Um, the last thing after we get past the schedule, I don't think this is important, is what do we look at, what does it look like on your yearly expenditure? to start down this path. And we said, well, what if we do start with the, with the female facility? In your current model, you're spending, uh, you know, you're spending um, 80, around $84 million altogether. And that number is actually a little bit more because we actually added the maintenance that we hadn't identified before. Um, and actually, I, I don't think this is quite right. This number that's showing is 76, I believe actually goes in the opposite direction. You're adding more capital costs. So I apologize. I think we have a wrong number here. But, but in essence, we're saying to start with the women's facility, you'd be adding around 6 to $7 million a year to your annual outlay from where your operations are right now. Your operations are $84 million right now. And that, uh, and that when, I, when we add the, the total operating costs, um, it's, it's an addition of around $6 million. Now, that number you know, would be in play then as you retire the bond, we know you have 20 year bond retirement. And then you may add another project as it, as it comes, as the women's facility comes online, improve staffing. So that operation cost can come down. So we could look at those different scenarios, but this is one way to look at it in that you're already spending $84 million a year to, to embark on a new facility it does cost money, but in terms of your annual outlay, what we find is it's not necessarily as burdensome as, as, as other times. Now we've had scenarios where we've had a cost neutral one, where we've had so many bad facilities and in, in a particular system that one new facility actually can replace that cost. We're not, we're not suggesting that's necessarily the case here. And if you had all the money to start with in day one, you could move in that direction. But what we would encourage moving forward to look at this on that annual basis and, and to look at what that, you know, what, what your, what your uh, yearly expenditure would be to get down the road of, of solving it. So I'm done with my presentation. I'd be happy to take more questions or have more, more dialogue here. Questions. Questions. There's got to be questions. I have a couple. Is... Okay, let's go with Senator Benning first, and then we'll go to Representative Coffey and go from there. Jeff, this is a, a finer detail, but you had transportation costs listed. Are those transportation costs, do they include the uh, sheriff's expenses for bringing people to and from court? No, those are, so those are DOC. So the, the other transportation costs that would be for your sheriff's departments would be outside of these transportation costs. So that's not factored in anywhere in your presentation? 
It's not. No, we only and by agreement with the groups, we just factored in the, the expenses that you had direct control over. But there would be an impact on sheriffs and sheriff spending. OK, thank you. Uh, Representative Coffey. Sure, and we could take the, this, the PowerPoint down if if sure for this, if that might help. And then that might help with our conversation. Yeah, Absolutely. Then folks can then raise their blue hands or yellow hands on the participant list. So, so Jeff, this is great to have this, this, um, these, all these visualizations and the options on the table. I kind of wanted to go back to um, some basic information because I know our colleagues outside of this uh, joint committee are going to be asking this. You know, th it is striking the the increased number of beds that we're looking at in this model. Um, and I understand, you know, if we're adding, which we do want to add reentry facilities, that obviously is a factor. And we want to have the way a hotel needs to have space to be able to move people around. But considering that we're doing, working so hard on justice reinvestment and our numbers are going down even before the pandemic uh, and before our courts are closed, you know, this, this higher number makes me feel a little uncomfortable without understanding more deeply why we need to, when we currently have had uh, a pretty steady number of 115 women in total, why we would need a facility for 144 plus 50. That's just one example, but maybe you could kind of back us up. I know when you came and spoke before us um, earlier, we talked about this, but I, I feel like I need to be regrounded in why we're looking at finding 2,050 beds for our system. Sure. I would say off the top, the, uh, the 150 that represent reentry are beds you just don't have at all right now. And so that th they would be additional. And I think they have a different mission than what the corrections beds are. So I think the way that, uh, that we've been looking at it as we've been developing the report is that the 1900 represents um, th that's, that's, that's more in line with your turn with, with your, with solving the correctional bed issue as far as having more capacity, because some of the facilities are at capacity, they're not as effective as they can be, but also again, bringing home the inmates that are in Mississippi. So that's at 1900 and then the 150 represents the reentry, the 50 beds for women, the 100, the 100 for men, the 144 for women, that, that again does come from some, from some historic data because prior to the pandemic, what we saw was the four years prior your state was incredibly steady with what those numbers were. Um, it, had res it, there ha it had been a reduction from previous years prior to that, but for those four years plus as we came to the pandemic, those numbers were pretty steady. So that's what we went off of and we added some capacity to again, have more effective bet as you put it, you know, be able to move people around. Um, and so that's how the number has come out to that. But I, I would stress again, I think the 1900 represents if I'm apples to apples with your current system, those are correctional beds. 150 represents new services, which you just don't have that have been, you know, have been requested for us to look at of establishing a true reentry system. Uh, but those, uh, those reentry beds, those folks that would qualify to be in those reentry beds are currently taking up a hard bed in our current facilities. So they're not new people. They're currently in our facilities without a reentry program. So those folks would just be moved to a reentry bed. That was my point, actually. Yeah, it doesn't. We so don't. It might, it might be fewer people. corrections beds then. In right. That scenario. Yeah, that, I, 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 that's something to consider. I, I think. I, I don't know if the DOC folks might want to comment on that as well. I mean, they've been. They, you know, they helped, uh, you know, advise us on some of these numbers. Uh, I, I, I don't know what opinions you guys might share on that, on that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to also remember, <clears throat> maybe do, and Commissioner Baker or Joey uh, Al Cormier can help here. How many, how many beds do we currently have in our current system? This is 1,600 or 1700. I think it's about 17 um, from the. Okay. 
I can look it up while we're talking. I, but I believe that number is about is in the seventeen hundred range for current. And I, I think Chief seven, Cormier can help you out with that, Madam Chair. Okay, no. and I think of that amount, there's about four hundred of those beds that are limited in use. They're restricted. Am I off base there, Al? No, you're you're correct. We're we're right around. I think it's seventeen seventy seven. <laughs> is where we're at for, for beds in, in state right now. Um, but they are limited and even more so now with COVID, mm -hmm. with our intake quarantine isolation units, we've, we've had to revamp every facility in order to accommodate those those beds, um, which takes us back to our, you know, your earlier conversation asking about general population beds, which is what this, this new design would, would provide. I know it says minimum security, medium security, special needs, but it really is those are really the general population beds that we're in, in need of. So Jeff, when you're talking about the 2000 beds or 2050, does that include booking beds? Yes. Does, uh, and infirmary well, beds? Those are a little bit different. No, those are actually, those, so no, the 2050 are the rated beds. So those are the beds that would be assigned. Okay. To so there are additional medical beds that are infirmary beds that we don't, we don't usually we don't have that in the total. So those would be an addition as far as, because they're temp beds and the book, there would be booking capacity. We've built in booking capacity, but that's not reflected in those, in those beds. And I don't believe those are reflected in the current bed counts either. No, they, they, those are in our current bed counts. They are. They are. The booking or the infirmary too, Al? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So what we're looking at in, in my brain, the simple brain here, is we have about 1,300 beds that are flexible in our system for general population. That's excluding your infirmary, your booking, closed custody, that type of situation. So we're talking about 2,500, of which 150 would be re-entry. So we're at 1,900 almost looks like we're adding general population beds to our current numbers. And, and to I, some extent we are, and that, that would, that's that 15% that vacancy rate that is the national average that puts us in line with ACA standards, um, which is something we don't have right now. And, and as you know, through recent construction projects through, through our facilities, we've had to ship people out of state because we don't have the beds to keep them. Um, ongoing construction, new construction in the future, that would be eliminated as we have the bed space to, to accommodate those numbers. So Al, are you looking at that 1700 plus as the basis for that 15% vacancy rate, not the 1300 plus? Correct. Okay. Right, and I, and I guess, yeah, it's, it is additional beds without anticipating additional people. <laughs> in, in, in. we are we are planning for empty beds and and, and however you want to address that but that that is something that is, that is typical for you know operational um you know uh, you know to meet aca standards and better operations is to build in more empty beds so it gives them the flexibility so part of, can i ask the follow-up question yeah. just real quick so if that if there is a 15 percent vacancy rate how is that reflected in the numbers of the per diem per bed is that calculated based on all those beds being full or are you count building in the 15 percent um um un unoccupancy we're suggesting that there that no that that percentage is empty that we're not suggesting that we are filling every single bed and okay. even as we calculate the per diem it's an excellent question and it actually makes me want to look at my calculations one more time. But I, but I believe we are we are factoring in those that that's that certain percentage not being filled right now. Okay, that'd be great to really. I, I'm curious too. Just we want to. There's a lot of math here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and I wouldn't want to see. No, I think to your point, it's it's a great question because I wouldn't want we we wouldn't want to artificially raise lower the per diem by assuming that there's beds that should be empty would be full and that would then automatically reduce your per diem. Um, I, I don't think we did that, but I, I do want to double check on that now that you've asked. Thank you. So we have some more questions. Representative Dolan, Representative Taylor, and Representative Martell. So Representative Dolan. 
Thank you. Thank you for this overview. It's so much information to, to process. Um, and I definitely appreciate the re-entry facility focus in all the different models. And this ties into the previous question about numbers, because we are doing tons of work on justice reinvestment and trying to um, really reduce the number of folks that are being incarcerated when we can. And so I'm curious in these models where if it was considered, you know, can some um, of the units spaces be um, shifted to be to increase reentry beds? Like say all of a sudden we're doing really great work and folks are moving more towards reentry. Is that a possibility in any of the new construction that you're designing or are these gonna be fixed? Um, Cause I'm guessing that there needs to be different considerations for re-entry type beds versus fully incarcerated beds. Right, I, I think so. No, it's a great question. And um, often the minimum security design that we do lends itself well to a, what we would call a step down. So it may not be full re-entry where you're necessarily outside the facility, but it can essentially have a lot of the same program and have the basically the look and feel of what re-entry would be still inside the facility. So we refer to that as step down. And so often the, the minimum security can serve that purpose. Um, so minimum security, minimum security serves a lot of different needs. You know, it may be trustees that work at the facility. It could be re-entry. It could be people that are, again, in that transition then to go to re-entry. But the minimum security are meant to be more of that kind of atmosphere that you would see in the, in the re-entry, if it's not exactly. Um, but again, as a more detailed study emerges, you might decide that some of the minimum would be just like the reentry, but they just may still be in the secure part of the fence or, or some other kind of scenario like that. So I think there is the flexibility to, um, to increase the reentry program and the step down program by being able to utilize those beds. Representative Taylor and then Representative Martel. Ah, um, those 50 beds in the, in the re-entry facility for the women could also be, I don't, I'm not sure how the, how the number was derived, but it could also be coming from the community where we've been told the community services are currently inadequate. And uh, so the 50 could come, could be those that are in the, in the community that would uh, be better served in a re-entry facility. Was what I was thinking, it, but it, the, the problem is that we do need to be able to have a, a a good explanation for that number. If we're going to build a facility for 50 beds, we need to be able to say those 50 beds are 50 that were in CRCF and are now in a re-entry, or those 50 beds were in the community and are now in a re-entry. Um, it, it's going to be an issue that that's going to come up. How did we get that number? And I think we, it would be good to have a nice explanation of how that was derived. Okay, uh, and uh, we can give more detail on, on where we got that. And I think there's also one more scenario too that, as you said, there are probably uh, some women uh, and men too, but it was some women that are in, uh, in, your, in your custody beds that would be in a reentry right now if it existed. And would and would have then either create more room, or may create different sentencing um, from judges. Just that if it, with the increased capacity, that may say, look, we have more in reentry, but we may have more in custody. That that because I didn't have enough beds, my other option was just to return people out. That may not that might not have been first choice. That you know that might that might have been a scenario that a judge wasn't able to utilize. Because we've, you know, I've had it with other projects where, you know, the scenario is either to put them in an inappropriate detention facility or put them back on the street. Neither of those are the right ones. So this third option of either, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, it might be diversion, might be reentry, you know, gives you one more option where that might be the most appropriate solution for somebody that right now doesn't have an appropriate solution. Yeah, the, the, the flip side of that, of course, is the judge knowing that there's empty beds in an incarcerated facility puts people there who needn't really be there. And that's what other people would argue that happens if you build a facility that's more than you need. So there's potential for that as well. Yeah. So I have another question, Representative Martel. 
Mine isn't really a question, but it's a statement. Isn't it better to have an empty bed than to wish you had a bed available? It is, but the question is, if you have a bed, they'll fill it. That's always been the balancing act. But I think one thing that may be helpful in really determining the final bed size in, for some populations, the way you've laid out the process in terms of the capital needs so that you don't get slammed with a $250 million all of a sudden in one or two years, you, you're phasing this in. So through that phase in process, you would have a better feel for what your actual bed needs are going to be once we have put in our initiatives, further initiatives with the council of state governments with justice reinvestment. And the testimony we've also been receiving from corrections for the past couple of years, it really looks like our population pre-COVID and then probably going forward after COVID is going to be around 1900 folks. And that includes the women. That seems to be the baseline. We may change that, it may go down by 100, or may go up by 100, but that seems to be the baseline that we've heard in house corrections and institutions for the last couple of years. And I don't know if on the DOC world, if that has changed or not. I know, I know COVID has changed it, but once the courts are gonna start opening up here in the next few weeks, and I think our numbers are gonna start going up. Our feeder system has not been open. You know, Madam, Madam Chair, I think this is, the, uh, this is the question, right? And I think what Jeff and the, staff's, <clears throat> the staff at DOC did was the best they could to take a look at the numbers. But, I, and I don't wanna cut off um, questions, but I, I just wanna make a couple statements to get people to, to be thinking about what you just talked about, right? Um, over the next year, year and a half, two years, is really a big discussion about how we're gonna bring flexibility into the system. And you heard Jeff talking about, I mean, we have 400 beds right now that we can't even really use. It's driving our cost, our operational cost. We, we're one of the leaders in the country in operational cost. That's, that's one problem. The other problem is our systems don't allow us to have the flexibility that Jeff is describing to be more creative in the programming that you, you, you and I think Representative Tower touched on this. You could in fact have more people inside beds, but you're creating better programming for transition. Because what happens now, as you all know, and we've talked about this you know, quite a bit since I've, I've been around the last year and a half is that someone transitions out and it's from, from jail to transitional housing. No, no stop in between. And what, as I've been listening to the work being done here by, by Jeff and his staff and, and uh, Commissioner Fitch and her staff and my staff, is my mind is just running with the ability to bring programming into the system that creates better outcomes and will be in the spirit of what Justice Reinvestment 2 is, if this is making sense. Now our jails are built that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real challenge to do the kind of programming um, that is gonna have infect, uh, effective impact on individuals on their ability to transition back to society. And so, as I heard Representative Teller talking, um, I, I think you're right, it's, it's how, you, how you say it, right? Are the 50 beds that transitional is coming from what we already pay for transitional housing in the community? You know, and I'm pretty familiar with that because we're in the middle of the, the bid process right now for proposals coming back for, for a new form of housing. You know, the number's around $6 million a year. But I wouldn't, I think this is the conversation that we have to have. You have what you have in front of you and it's gonna take you a while to digest that information. But then the real conversation now starts about how are we gonna move forward 
with enough flexibility that we're not rushing into something so we can see how programming is working as we make each step. I mean, I think that's the real challenge and it's, it's not gonna be easy. And uh, the, the light in the moment for a minute, I'm, I'm not gonna be with you all the way through this. So I'm just, <laughs> just for the record. You can't do that. That's, that's, for, my, that's for my friend, Senator, my good friend, Senator Mazza there. You're right. staying on this, Jim. He, he's committed you to a lifetime commitment. That's just right. so yeah, you know. he, he thinks he has. Sir. Remember you signed that paper, you didn't read the small print. Right. I, 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 can, I can start acting like I've lost my mind and they'll, they'll force me out. But, <laughs> but no, seriously, I, I think for me, I, I just want everybody to be thinking about that because I realized that there's going to be a lot of pushback about building new jails. I get it. But, but well, let me tell you, our system is not built for the programming or the environment we need to, to rehabilitate people. It's not. The, you know, I, Jeff, I, I, I was struck by it. It's just ringing in my head from your last presentation when you talked about the nature of the way our facilities are built. The construction makes life stressful for everybody. It's loud. It's, it's not a lot of white. You know, Jeff, several times I heard you talk today about uh, normalization, right? The way the facilities are built to normalize people's lives inside. More light, um, the ability to program. Somebody asked the question about, well, I think it was you, Senator Benning, do we have to move people all the way from one place to another to have contact with their attorneys? That work for us right now inside the facilities, it doesn't sound like a lot. It's a major step to get someone to their, their, to their attorney. And to normalize the system, to have better outcomes, the way we treat people with hum humility, you know, with a little bit of human dignity, is a big piece of what we're talking about here. So I, I just kind of want to put that out there. I know it's going to be a hard sell, but, but let's not lose the target of, of the next year, two years of capital money really digging into what do we want our correctional system to look like 20 years from now? That's the real question to me. And uh, so, Commissioner, I, I put that out there. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow up and dovetail off of that. I, I'm pretty sure I'm the only criminal defense attorney on the screen right now. There's a couple of things that appear to be universal. One is that the women's facility, as it currently exists, needs to go. At the other end of the spectrum, I get a sense that option A is not something that we're going to be seriously considering because it is too much at one time to try to contemplate and would result in paralysis trying to accomplish the eventual goal. In between there, there's a whole lot of other things to talk about. Alice, I heard you say there's an expectation when the court system opens up again, we're going to have a rise in the inmate population. I'm going to throw a counterpunch there and say, in fact, there's a lot of people currently incarcerated who wouldn't be incarcerated had the court system been moving. So in fact, in my head, I'm going to feel like there's a population that's going to be on the downturn as cases move forward because they will be getting out and they will be getting into the programming that they can't get right now because of this state of COVID paralysis that we are currently in. But I, I, I'm really feeling the urge here to concentrate our conversation in such a way that we can make a step as a result of being uh, constantly running around in circles trying to figure out how to do everything at once. And that seems to center on the women's facility. Um, getting that replaced first, getting programming and step-down beds or release beds, however you want to fashion the, the terminology, gives us a starting point to figure out from a lowest cost perspective, how we begin to make moves that will have an impact later on down the road as we transition the men into the same process. But I would hate to leave these conversations going too much longer, walking around in circles, trying to figure out what's our next step going to be. Because I know on, on the Senate side, I've got people very loud and very Oops. Uh, concerned that we not get so uh, bogged down in the overall details of the entire system that we, we get lo losing the, uh, the trees for the forest. 
let's take a first step would be my recommendation. Let's concentrate on building a women's facility and deciding what kind of bed space for step down purposes is going to be wrapped around that. That seems to be the least expensive uh, thing to have to accomplish. And we can figure out all of those little details, like how far do you have to walk your, your inmate uh, to a telephone for attorney client privileges. And while that may sound relatively uh, minor in comparison to the big picture, all of that not only takes time and personnel on the inside, but it has a direct impact on the court system's ability to move forward as we can't do things. Let me give one example. In St. Johnsbury, there is a video room. It happens to be the same room that the attorney telephone line is in. So if there's a, a court hearing going on where there's an inmate on the video screen, and then I'm another attorney trying to call my client inside the facility, I can't reach them. So the entire system takes a back seat and we can't move forward in some fashion. I'm desperate for this conversation to come up with some kind of a concrete plan in the initial phases of deciding, okay, we're gonna take this step for now and we're gonna see how things work. And then we can incorporate what happens, best case scenario for the women into what we do on a bigger picture for the men because there's so many more of them. That's and I, want, and I, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, Senator. I think that's, that, that this, this is a big conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very big conversation and it's not an easy conversation. Um, you know, and some folks will say we don't we don't need um, jails. Um, you know, that's one spectrum. But at the other end, if you're going to have a, a, a jail system where you incarcerate human beings and take away their freedom, the environment that we have them in now is very challenging when it comes to given that level of humanity that everyone deserves. And I, and I'm glad you just brought that yeah. comment up about some people believe you shouldn't have prisons. I'm a criminal defense attorney. It's my job to keep people out of prisons. But if someone were to suggest that we don't need to have a prison for either women or men, <laughs> that would be an absolute mistake. And I know there are people that disagree with that, but some of the people that I work with, including women, are not people we can have in society. And that is a critical statement to make. If you decide to go without a prison for women, even if it's a small one, I'm going to say as a criminal defense attorney, you are making a terrible mistake. And, and I just, Madam Chair, I'll just, and I'll, I'll end here because I know we're, we're, we're getting it on, on time here. But, you know, the other thing I just want to make clear for, for everybody that's listening, and again, I don't, I work with the legislature to set policy and with the administration and, you know, how we deliver correctional services in the state. You know, all these recommendations are just recommendations. I can see now where people will think that we're moving towards closing jails. And this is just the primer for a bigger conversation over the next two years about where, where are we going to be in our, in our correctional system. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, Madam Chair. So I, I want to continue on what Senator Benning was saying about replacing the women's facility. And that is the first step that we need to take. The issue is you need land to build a facility. So the question then becomes, do you do a standalone facility for the women and buy land somewhere? Or do you start having to look in terms of your long-term plan of where you're gonna head with the other facilities in our system? and you do the women's facility as your first step into that long-term plan. That's the crux of the issue of replacing the women's facility. Where are you gonna build it? Where's the land? You can't have a facility without land. So then that leads into, do you look at the other proposals for the male facilities and have a phased in process where you start with the women's facility knowing you're going to do the male facilities down the road. That's what's before us. I just get nervous that as you get into the second part of the head conversation, we end up right back in the 
we can't make any decision phase. Um, so I guess if I had my personal druthers, and I'm certainly not as experienced as you are, but deciding that the women are going to have a new facility is step one. Getting a place where the land is, is gonna be step two. And then wrapping our heads around how many women need to be in a secure facility versus how many don't would be step three, but at least giving our colleagues the impression that we are moving um, and not coming up with a 20 year plan that's focused on everybody when the immediate problem is the women. We could talk about this all day and go around. Right. Well, I think that there's general, I think there's agreement between both committees. We have to replace the women's facility. The question is, where do you put it? That's the issue. Where are you gonna put it? So I know Representative Taylor had his hand up. And now I see it went down, so. Well, I was, uh, I was just, a, it was a quick question for Senator Benning. He may have just answered it. When, when he was saying the emphasis is on uh, replacing the women's facility, uh, I noticed the, the singular there. We are replacing the facility, but was he thinking replacing it with two facilities or with one? Um, as uh, a re-entry and a um, more secure one, or are you more concerned with just replacing the facility with something um, at that security level? Uh, Kurt, the easy way of answering that is we know that there is a core number of women that are going to have to be in a secured environment. There's just no way around that. How large that is, is really gonna be a discussion for corrections to have to figure out. But the step down area, there isn't any reason it can't be a separate building on the same campus. Um, if you are going to have a facility. He froze. Yep. You, fr you froze, Joe. We froze. It worked. We froze them out. <laughs> <laughs> Does this happen a lot? <laughs> you froze up, Joe. <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking at my screen, seeing everybody else is frozen up. Um, so, Kurt, I'm going to make, make it quick because I don't know how stable my connection is, but there isn't any reason why you can't have separate buildings for the uh, step down facilities on the same campus because for programming purposes, you may have people who are receiving the same services no matter what building they happen to be housed in. So from an operational standpoint, you would preserve costs if you have the folks in the same location. Yep, I understand, makes perfect sense, thank you. So I think the half million that's in FY22 is to really have BGS and DOC take those first steps and trying to figure out how do we go forward in replacing the women's correctional facility and come back to us in January with different options on how we move forward. That's my understanding and I think that's the House Institutions Committee understanding as well, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, committee members. But we've, we're, I don't know if I I don't know if I agree with that. Well, I know that what you're looking at, Kurt, is a 50 bed reentry program, and that's inclusive of what we're looking at in the half million. I I want to do more than just have more options put before us in January. I want to consider the options now and make a step forward. And what would that step be forward? A it would be. It would be similar to what Senator Benning says to start putting together some schematics for what a uh, women's facility would look like, facilities would look like, getting an accurate bed count for each one of them, which is something I've been trying to get for a year or so now. Talk to the people, the caseworkers within corrections that, that are work with the CRCF uh, women and say, how many of these women could be in a reentry facility rather than locked up in a with a razor wire and start putting together a, a population estimate for the reentry facility. And then draw, get down to schematics and exactly what it would look like, the kind of programming it would require. Figure out how many therefore would be left in the uh, higher security women's facility 
and worry about the programming and schematics for that without worrying about where it's going to be put. Just get started on the design and the um, basic structure of the, of the buildings and have something that can then we can say, okay, where are we going to put these and worry about that in January, although we could start some site location uh, analysis at this point as well. That's where I would like to go. Anyone want to weigh in on that? Well, yeah, I, I will. I'm, I'm the, uh, on the Senate side, so I don't put up one of those cute little yellow hands. We just, the senators sort of jump in and dominate the conversation. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, there's um, less of but, you, that's why. <laughs> yeah, Alice, we were party to the conversation about bringing the women back from St. Albans down to Chittenden. And the rationale behind that was the services were going to be available. Their children were likely to be close by or there were daycare facilities that were going to be available. So having it somewhere in the um, Montpelier Burlington corridor is probably a good idea. And I agree with Kurt that it, getting some prospective site locations is not a difficult process, doesn't require a whole lot of money, but at least getting the conversation up to where we have a prospective location that we can talk about, even if there's two or three options. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen? Yeah, so I, I agree with Rep Taylor on the urgency for, for the women. Um, and I also think it's our responsibility to look at that long-term vision of the whole population and our whole correctional facilities. Because the land that we might want to look at, you know, if it's going to incorporate other facilities, like we need to keep that in mind as we're, as we're purchasing it. Um, so I see that there is a priority for a uh, women's correctional facility, the re-entry, and then I'm guessing it's a parity thing, or if we're having re-entry for women, then we need to have it with men at the same time. Um, so I would see that, but I think it would be irresponsible for us if we didn't take that pause to think about how are we going to um, look at any of the other facilities in our state, because we might want to get the land that can encompass all of that. Other folks, Scott. Oh, yeah, I guess I'll weigh in too. I, I, I think Kurt's point, from what I heard, is we ought to begin schematic design for a women's facility now because we know we need that. And and as as a, a on a parallel track, we should be looking for a place to put it. Um, and uh, I think Senator Benning's right; it ought to be in in the uh, Burlington Montpel Montpelier area. Um, since that's where most folks are. Uh, and it does make sense to me that we would be looking for land that could accommodate a larger facility um, uh, like op option C that uh, Jeff just presented to us. So that seems like a path forward. You know, not easy path, but that's a path forward. Jeff, how many acres would it take for option C for doing that new facility that also includes the women and the male reentry. Do you know how many acres that would take? As from C? Mm -hmm. um, let me, I, I think- It basically just, replaces the Northwest facility. Right, for the, for, for, for the women's and the, uh, let me look, if you would, please. I'll-, um, I'll You'll look at that while we have another yeah. state. Okay. Yeah. So Sarah and then Kurt. This I think it's great. The acreage it would help us figure out something. Yeah. Well, you, we have plenty of acreage at the Northwestern facility to expand. You need acreage no matter what facility you're building, and you need water and sewer. So the, the reentry facilities themselves are around two and a half acres each. But if you had a reentry facility and you had the incarcerated facility on the same property, two separate buildings. So then, if you had a, if you had the, if you had the women's prison and a a women's reentry, somewhere in the range of twenty five to thirty acres, is probably what you're looking for, for that. Um, and then you know the male one that was the smaller one that was six hundred beds in C that was about forty acres roughly. For that, so the women would be twenty-five to thirty men, somewhere in the range of forty acres is what you're looking for. So for option C, 
if you did option C, which is build new to replace the St. Albans facility, along with your 100 bed male reentry, along with your women incarcerated piece and your women reentry piece, what's the acreage for all of that? All, all, all of those together are in about 70 acres. Just to put it in perspective for folks when you're thinking of buying land and where. So Sarah and then Kurt. Um, this is, I really appreciate being able to have this conversation together with our colleagues from the Senate. Um, I just want to make sure that when we're, when we're talking about uh, something that Representative Taylor said, um, that we're not only thinking about a reentry facility, that I want to make sure that, the, that we are replacing the, the the prison as well, because we know that that is such a huge issue. And I'm hoping, I want, this question is for, for Jeff, um, have you, in our committee in the house, we've, we've heard uh, a little bit about the facility in Maine um, that had a, a facility for women and a reentry facility on the same um, uh, piece of land. Have, is that one of the, you mentioned a number of models in your presentation, but that was not one of them, but have, have you, looked at that, has that come into your thinking? And because I don't think that was a 30 acre parcel, but I could be wrong. It, it might not be, I mean, it, we've, done, we've done it with co-location and, and you know, we've done it where you've had, uh, and you, know, you can share some things like uh, food service and, and laundry, some things like that. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we didn't do that particular one, but we've done it um, in other, other jurisdictions where we've had the co-location. Um, and I mean, we've had them in the same building in some cases where we've had reentry and incarceration. So it's doable. Um, the number of acres that we're showing in the report right now are probably in the more conservative higher side. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't be able to have more efficient facility, you know, derived. It could be a little bit smaller, but, but we felt like at this stage for the report, it was better to give you the more outside larger number to deal with rather than, than too small. And as you, you know, as you, as you look at acres, we not have enough, but um, we've done, we, yes, we're familiar with other ones where those things have happened at the same, at the same place. I think the important thing too, for reentry is just that wherever it's located, whether it's co-located with the, you know, with custody or not, is that there are the opportunities for jobs, there's the opportunity for other community service, uh, public transportation, all those things are, are you know, I think are, are, are real keys. And um, so, you know, how close they are to the, the custody situation, it's equally important to understand where they are versus, you know, with the services that, that are required. So we have some more questions. There's Kurt, Michael, and Michelle. So Kurt? Uh, the, the other thing that we could move on, uh, almost all of these scenarios or options do talk about an expansion of Southern state. Um, and we're spending what, five and a half million each year on the out of state contract and a $24 million expansion of Southern state, we could bring perhaps some of those out of state people back and save money there and put it into the renovation of, or the uh, expansion of Southern state. We could almost all these scenarios talk about that and we could start putting together the details of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael and then Michelle. Yes, I was just thinking is how much acreage is that the, um, if it's going to be totally vacated at the Middlesex uh, police barracks, probably not that kind of acreage, though, I'm guessing. Does anybody know? It's too chopped up. Yeah. Too chopped up. Okay. I, we have the archives. Trying to take out a lot of that corridor. Okay. We have right, the archives you. there, and then we have the state police barracks there. Yeah, not enough it's then. A okay. It's a wetland. Where the trailers are, it's more like a swamp. All right. That's why they're sinking. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Michelle? Yeah, my question is about the, the model for the reentry facilities. As, as far as I can tell from what was introduced today, there's a lot of different permutations for how different prisons might be, might, might be built and might be run in the coming years. But all of them, it sounds like the model was the same, 50 for women and 100 for men and one central location. And I guess I'm just wondering 
Why is that? Because in terms of effective reentry, if you can have people going back into more of a community setting, a more intimate setting, it seems like you actually would have a higher a higher likelihood of having people reintegrate and build relationships and sign up for COSAs in their host community with supportive members and things along those lines. It also feels like it would be a lot less expensive if you might buy existing, you know, an apartment or a house in a variety of different communities around the state instead of building one centrally located one. It feels like that might be a model that would be really effective, both in terms of cost and also in terms of meeting people's needs. So I don't know, it's it's not what's on the table, but I guess I'm just asking the question before we go too far down the road, do we have to have one central women's reentry and one central men's, or could we divide them up into communities and have smaller groups of people from the, uh, the areas that they came from? Uh, I, I think I'm gonna ask maybe DOC to comment on that, but I, I think, I think you guys already do have a like a, like like a reintegration program that does involve residential living, that but that, not that, enough. And well, some some not, regions it, have it okay. and some don't. So, but so the reentry is really looking at really a different thing than than that, and that it is it, it's the next step down to then perhaps being in that next system you're talking about. And so I, I think for the purposes of this report as we worked with the DOC and looked at where the programs have already worked for reducing recidivism, what their capacity is for operations, because in any of these situations, when you do, uh, you, you still have to manage the folks in the program one way or another, and whether that's, you know, if they're, if they're spread out more, that, that, that could have a staffing impact. But what we settled on for this, this iteration of the report was looking at this one singular reentry in addition to the custody, which isn't to say that's at the exclusion of the other housing that you just described. Um, and I think, you know, and, and I, I think that is, you know, if I look at the overall system, because the overall system is really other things like also probation, parole that we didn't get into. This, this was really the focus of the people that are housed and are essentially wards of the state currently right now in the system. And that, that was the, per, you know, that was really what we did focus on for the report but which isn't to say that perhaps expanding that look wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate as you move forward. Sometimes yeah, you take a little step to get to yeah. the community. Uh, Commissioner? I don't know if you wanted me to comment, but, but Representative, I think um, what we're really proposing in a transitional uh, housing um, structure is an in-between what you're describing and what we have now. And we know from our work now, and this, you know, and I'll, I'll use, I'll use a, a woman leaving Chittenden as an example. And I don't mean to make it just focused on the women because I think we run into the same thing with men. I think one of the areas that we're challenged, and I've said this before in front of the committee, is the transition from facility to community. And, you know, just picture being in a structured environment where you're told to do something you know, it's time to eat breakfast. It's time to take a shower. It's time for lunch. Okay, you can go to recreation. Time for programming. Time for dinner. Time to go to bed. And then you drop them in a community, and we wonder why. Even if it's supportive, but a lot, some sometimes a lot of their support systems prior to going into a facility are not positive. And I know the coses are out, coses are out there and the CJCs, but we're proposing a step down where. A woman could be reunited with her family where, where DCF is working with them in an environment that's supportive, well-structured, well-programmed. That's what Maine looks like. And then they transition into transitional housing in the community, if that makes sense. So we're proposing a step in between in order to help for that step down to the community to be better prepared. And we think the outcomes could be better. Uh, and if Al, if, if I'm missing a step there, please, please step in and correct me. You've, you've covered it. So we have another question here, Karen. Yes. Um, so I know we're doing our job and asking lots of questions and picking, picking things out of this. And I just want us to pause and like, this is a huge deal. I remember, um, cause I've worked with the women's correctional population when they were up at Northwest and made that move to um, CRCF and you know, that was what 10 plus years ago and so the fact that now we're having the conversation about making this happen is 
is huge. Um, and so that brings me to my question of how, where do we go from here? Like, what is the next step? Because I feel like we have this, but now we're already branching off in all these different areas. How do we move forward from here? Because for me, at least, I'm like really excited that this is happening. I realize it might not be ideal, but this is huge from where we were 10 years ago. So I don't know who gets that question, but I don't, I'm curious how we move forward from here. So that may be something that DOC and BGS can weigh in on in terms of what their process would be between now and January with a half million, because that's the next step. I, I would, because uh, I, 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 I don't run BGS, Commissioner Fitch does. So I'm gonna let Commissioner Fitch weigh in because a big piece of this, of what we're talking about next, no, no, next, no matter what shape it takes, is going to be a lot of focus in BGS, um, I, I think. But I'll let I'll let um, I'll let the commissioner weigh in. Commissioner, you're muted. Okay. Oh, no, you're on. You're on. Okay. Sorry. Um, for the record, my name is Jennifer Fitch, and I am the BGS commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Baker, for letting me speak. Maybe um, you're in your office in Montpelier. I am. I'm in my two Aiken office. It's yes. very exciting. Um, so I do want to jump in and say that um, Madam Chair, Alice Emmons is completely correct, right? We have one large system and you can't plan independently for one piece without consideration to all the other components in the system, because then what that does is it gets us into trouble because as we focus on one group, what does that mean? And what is the impact on all the other groups? So it all has to be carefully coordinated and, and thoroughly thought of in terms of the overall system, right? So our recommendation in terms of next steps would be to finalize the number of beds um, and then do a programming study for all facilities. And from there, we could then start to parcel off once we have a, a larger plan, if you will, the various components of the plan. And so that's what we would recommend between now and January would to take that money and to continue the programming study for all facilities. And we will report back on that um, when we meet again in January. That would be our recommendation. So I'm going to make a, a observation, Commissioner, if I can. I have a lot of senators who are very angry about the fact that the women's facility has been in such dire straits for so long that we keep pushing it back for study after study after study. It is a pretty simple thing, I think, for corrections to come up with a core number of beds that they feel have to be secured for women and to then translate how many beds they would estimate would be necessary for step down facilities. If we as a group can at least agree to discard option A, mm -hmm. that begins to focus us in a way that we can take individual steps to get to where we want to be in the long term. But a lot of what we are talking about with the women are going to be steps that we will then re-examine for the men. I don't think we can swallow in a report First, I don't think we have the political ability to try to adopt a universal report for everyone without many of us being chastised by our colleagues for once again delaying the conversation. Um, this is an opportunity for us with the current report we have to use it as a guideline, but it still needs those necessary components, i.e. your core group. How many people are necessary in a secure facility? I realize my internet connection is slipping once again, but I'm seeing some of you come and go, so I'm hoping you're still hearing me. We can hear you. Okay. My concern- shut off, your, shut off your video might help. All right, so I'm still here. You're still here. 
my concern is that we not walk away from this conversation without at least some marching orders that we get DOC on board with coming up with a core number of those secure beds and a core number for what they feel they are going to need to have for step down beds. And at the same time, frankly, start the investigation of a plot of land. I don't think if we discard option A that we are going to be looking at a universal campus. And in fact, I would steer us away from that conversation because of the much higher population of men in this equation men who are living all over the state. I realize the women do too, but there's a much smaller population to deal with. When it comes to the men, I'm going to at least some point argue that there should be separate facilities across the state because you have to talk about operational costs such as transportation of those men to and from their local courthouses, as well as trying to integrate them back into communities that are spread far and wide. And I don't think it makes any sense at all to have a universal campus for everybody because that could be problematic in, it, in and of itself. But I would like to be able to leave this conversation with at least focusing on DOC's ability to say, we need X core secure beds, X number of step down beds, and somebody in BGS is beginning to investigate where the plot of land ought to be that this might be going on. By my prior statement, one of the things I want you all to know is, right, I came in, I'm an engineer. I've never worked in the political or legislative world before. I've been watching us spin for four years and not make any decisions about where we're headed with the correctional uh, landscape, if you will. So I'm in the same boat as you. I'm an engineer. I want to move forward. I want to make some decisions and I want to start addressing gaps in the system. So I am very much in the same a uh, boat, if you will, as everybody else here is today. We're all in alignment that we need to take, do something and take some kind of action. However, I also wanna be very clear, and, and I told this to the House uh, Corrections and Institutions group when I first met them this year, which is, you know, the planning part is the most essential part to anything. And we have been shooting ourselves in the foot at BGS because we move too quickly and we don't do the planning that we need to do. So my recommendation today, the best thing that I can give you and offer you to move forward is we need to pick an option, right? We need to pick an option which sets a, a chart forward and we need to start planning. And if we don't do the planning that we need to do, we are going to get ourselves tripped up. So my recommendation to this committee is let's pick an option, whatever option that we pick, and then let's continue to move forward with planning and programming. You're talking about a huge system, right? So, so while I agree we've been stuck in this nebulous zone for a long time, and this report gives us a variety of options, which hopefully will get us unstuck so that we can move forward. We also don't want to move forward so quickly that we shoot ourselves in the foot and we make some bad decisions. So my recommendation to this committee is to pick an option or work with us to pick an option and let's continue to move forward with programming and planning and make some additional progress. I want that just as much as Commissioner Baker wants that, just as much as you want that, but we need to do it in the right way. And I think we all agree that the women's facility is the one that we start with, period. Well, Marsha and then Scott. We still always got Windsor. We own the land. Yes, we do. A hundred acres. Thank you, Marsha. <laughs> Scott. So I guess my question for Commissioner Fitch is, yes, we have to do planning. I'm, I'm big on planning also. Um, if we picked, let's say, if we picked uh, option C and we recognize that the first thing that needs to get built is a, is a women's facility, could we not move ahead with uh, schematic design and, and, and design of that facility while we're doing other things in parallel? So looking for the land. Uh, Kurt also mentioned uh, beginning, beginning to uh, plan for renovations at Southern State. Can we do these things in parallel rather than uh, serially? 
we can always do, um, that's the engineer brain there. So we can always do things in parallel, right? That's always an option. It's gonna require more money. It's gonna require more resources. And we have to make sure we don't get tripped up on each other, right? And that all these things are being done, right? And correlated together as they move forward. Absolutely. I would say schematic, to, so I would call what HOK did, and I'm gonna to look to Jeff and hopefully he'll confirm me here, um, is they did planning light, right? I mean, they were really looking at the entire system. So if you think about it, they're way up here, right? At the 1000 foot view. And really what we're talking about is picking an option. Now let's bring that view down, right? And let's let's take a closer look at what we're doing. So schematic design, in my opinion, is 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 too forward. Really what we need to do is we need to take a, a stronger look at programming and planning and take that further with the option that is selected, right? So we bring it from here and we bring it down here. Now, that being said, we're going to have to do that planning and programming for a female facility anyway. So we're not losing any ground. We're still making a lot of ground. Um, but what you're talking about is a pretty significant facility and it needs its due diligence in the planning and programming phase. And of course, from there, um, we lead off into the land search, right? Because once we know what the requirements are for the facility, now we know what we need for the land. And so the two go hand in hand, but you, I would, I tell you, do not look for land before you know what the requirements are for your facility, because then we're going to get ourselves tripped up, right? It all has to go in a certain order. Well, but we might want to look for land that that accommodates more than just the women's facility also. We might wanna look for land that accommodates option C uh, for, for men's facility in the future. But not something we're building next year or for two years from now, but, um, but that's, let, let, I mean, my idea would be we find land that, that accommodates that, but we build the women's facility, you know, pronto. That, that, would, be, that would be my. So, and that's and that's what programming and planning gets to in terms of those requirements. What are you going to need for power? What are you going to need for data? How far away from a town center do you want to be? You know, there's there's so many different facets that you need to consider, and that will then really bend down. Where do you you know what type of land are you looking for, and where is it located in the state? Right. And then you got to deal with the town. We haven't talked about the town. Some towns don't want you. You there may be a great piece of land somewhere that we're thinking, the town doesn't want it. Senator Mazza has his hand up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, sorry, Alice, you can ignore me. Uh, no. Having been through a few of these purchases on land for correctional facilities in the past, I can tell you that you've got to be specific of what you're going to put on that land because you can't buy it with the idea you're going to put a woman's facility, then five years later, they're going to want to know what your maximum capacity is going to be for permitting you because some people will accept a women's facility, but they probably won't accept 2000 people on that piece of land. They wanna know it fits with the community. So I've been through a few of these and that's the first question you're gonna get. So you gotta give them an answer up front. Yes, this is gonna be specifically for women or men or whatever, then they'll work with you. Thank you. Water, wastewater, there are so many different things right. to your point, right. Senator Maz, yeah. that you have to consider. It's not easy. And I second what Senator Moss has said, because I've been through it a few times myself. <laughs> and uh, we have to be very, very clear what we're doing. And it, coming from the capital world, you also look, do you expend money to purchase land or do you look at land that you already own? Because if you're gonna purchase land, there's investments that are gonna need to be made in that land in terms of building roads, building driveways, extending your water and sewer to the property and possibly even helping the community in one form or another. Senator McCormick has his hand up. Yes, I see. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that constitutionally, the state has a right to put a prison in a town, whether the town wants it or not. But I think it's disastrous politics. <laughs> I think it's disastrous. Work. No, that was, that's, the, that's the disclaimer. The yeah. point is, I think it would be disastrous politics. To Don't go there. <laughs> I, I think we want to, we want to have the the, the town. Um, well, we did it then with with the Springfield prison. The state originally was looking to put that in Windsor, and Windsor voted against it. Springfield voted for it. We we as an ob, we 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 didn't have to do it. We kind of did it as a out of respect. And and the fact that Springfield voted for it, I think, has made has made it less controversial in the years that it's been there. And I think it's a, it's a good idea to ask the town. I'm reluctant to put, even though we can, 
I'd be reluctant to put a prison where, where it's not wanted. So I think one thing that's real clear from this conversation, there needs to be a plan. There needs to be an agreement, particularly for the women's facility, for the number of beds for the incarcerated piece and the number of beds for the reentry. And that's been the long jam because up to this point, no one's been able to agree on the number of beds. Some folks feel the incarcerated, I think people agree 50 beds for the reentry. The incarcerative piece, is it 100 beds? Is it 150 beds? You build in the other juggernaut here that's gonna be really hard. Do you build for a 15% vacancy? Because the public interprets that, that you're building in for the capacity. You build the beds, they're gonna be full. So that's the other juggernaut. Do you do, when you're doing construction for a women's facility, incorporate that 15% vacancy? You can't move forward until you figure out how many beds and what they're gonna be used for. And I think we've coalesced around 50 beds for the reentry. I think we've coalesced around that you also need the incarcerative setting as well. You need two separate, two buildings. Kurt? I think we, we have, <laughs> there seems to be a consensus of the 50 beds, but I have no idea why I think it should be 50. It's just my gut. I've always said 50, and I think I need to have a very good explanation for why I think it's 50. <laughs> uh, and because there's going to be a lot of people asking, why is it 50? And that's why I think that uh, we should progress the way that, uh, that Senator Benning was talking, where we get the numbers and have DOC look at the numbers and come up with them so we can say, this is why we say 50. Can DOC agree on the number of beds we need as we go forward for the women? Yeah, Representative Taylor, I think, I think, you know, I'm not speaking for Commissioner Fitcher, but we're talking the same thing when she when she talks about programming we're talking about drilling into that number that hok just gave you to give some justification to as to why that number is 50 or if it turns out to be 35 or 45 because i think this is the point we're making is that the next step is to figure out the programming and, and what you need for buildings in order before you go looking for land and, and so I, I think we're saying the same thing. And, and Commissioner, if I'm, if I'm misspeaking, please, please let me know. You're, you're right on, right? That's what we're talking about. It's about the requirements. The requirements are going to be based off the population and the number in that population, right? And that is how we're going to progress that planning and programming study and determine what all the requirements then are wrapped around that population and that number of people. Just for the record, we are not in dispute. We are all agreed that the very first step is to have DOC come up with that number so we can get to the second step. Kind oh. <laughs> of take a break, kind of take yeah. a walk. Let's yeah, see. Alice, I have to leave actually in three minutes, so. Me too. <laughs> well, it's almost four o'clock, so this is a good breaking point. Um, Jeff, I wanna thank you for uh, presenting this. I know you and BGS and DOC have worked many hours over the weekend and many hours yesterday getting the report to us last evening, as well as preparing for today. And I'm sure that both committees will be reaching out to you uh, for further conversations. And I know both committees will be doing a deeper dive on this in the next few weeks because we're moving towards adjournment. Thank you for having us. Uh, we, we appreciate we appreciate, appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thanks for much. You may also be hearing from the Senate Judiciary Committee, which does the policy question on our end. So we'll you all have my contact information. So any, <laughs> any, 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 any time. Okay. Anything else from members before we sign off of YouTube? Okay, thank you folks for streaming in.